I wanted a sense of being able to understand humans and to belong. And I never felt that as a child. I've seen probably well over 2,500 clients at this point. Hello everyone, welcome to our Tech Minds Unwind series. Today we are going to be talking to Eva, who is an MA and PhD in clinical transpersonal psychology and is a digital nomad. She's currently an expat living between Mexico and Europe. She has an amazing life at the moment and she works with people from all walks of life to help them heal and live a more authentic and meaningful existence. So overall, she has a bunch of amazing experience and we're going to chat with her about a ton of things in this series. So it's great to have you here, Eva. Happy to just jump in. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great. Just tell us a bit about your journey and how did you become a therapist and now also a coach? So I'm going to go way back to childhood because I think this context is important, especially for the people who are listening to this. I grew up in a pretty large family in Hawaii and we did farming. My parents did a bunch of other jobs like massage, uh, working with schools, uh, building, stuff like that. So I come from a pretty salt of the earth, working class kind of family. And in our family, there was no emphasis on how to parent properly. There was no, there was nothing like attachment parenting. There were some morals that guided my upbringing, but I would say that primarily my parents were interested in us living a lifestyle where uh, the family got to be in nature and got to eat a healthy diet. So we did organic farming and they were very much interested in living kind of like that out in nature, self-sufficient lifestyle. Uh, there wasn't emphasis, though, on how to build emotion regulation skills. There was nothing. Uh, neither of them focused on how to have a healthy relationship between the two of them. There was nothing. There was no way we were taught uh, how to be humans that could engage in healthy social interactions, how to assess whether uh, what you're doing feels good to you. It was more about how to be productive, how to be a good worker, how to meet expectations. <laughs> it was pretty simple. So this home environment I grew up in had a lot of conflict and was rather dysfunctional. And being uh, from a pretty early age, I was a, a gifted person or a gifted child. So um, I was precocious. I was uh, very intelligent for my age, picked up on things very quickly, was perfectionist in a way too. And um, a lot of adults saw this. I, I was more interested in spending time with people older than me, partly because I was very mature for my age. But additionally, based on growing up in a really dysfunctional household, I became very mature for my age as a way to get my own needs met or to ensure that I had relevance in my family. So I'm sharing all this again, because I believe a lot of folks who end up in tech are also this way. I mean, you can come from many different cultural backgrounds, unique home environments, but at the core of it, there's this sense of being smart, a hard worker, somebody who wants to figure things out, somebody who gets rewarded for being a really hard worker, somebody who gets placed a lot of responsibility on you at a pretty young age. So how I found what I do now, based on all these different factors, I wanted to become a psychologist from a pretty young age. And I chose this because adults were coming to me who needed advice and were, I mean, in hindsight, talking to me about things that were kind of inappropriate for somebody my age. But um, I took pride in holding that much responsibility. So I even got into this work from a space of like codependency, perfectionism, giftedness, uh, because I thought that that's what I should be doing. Eventually, I had to go through this process of realizing the reasons why I was actually doing this and making adjustments to find a way to make this more balanced, to have better boundaries, figure out how to do this in a way that could be sustainable for me. I've changed. I've had several iterations of changing the way that I work in order to make it something that will actually be sustainable for me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That was like, I've never had someone answer that so authentically about their journey than what you just said. And I think all of it hit home. 
all of it just hits home as well because i feel like everything that you mentioned from like patterns and trying to make things problem solve in every way and also being a perfectionist at the same time is pretty much i think the patterns that almost everyone i know in tech has so yeah yeah, yeah. anything that was specific to you that stood out to you as a child which got you into this i know you said there were a bunch of things but that one thing which you like hold dearly to your heart which is like say this is why i got into this and this is why i continue as well you know i got really into astrology when i was a teenager and i i got very deeply into western astrology and um finding people's birth charts and studying the aspects between the different stars and planets and trying to really understand the people that i was around but the core of that is that i wanted a sense of being able to understand humans and to belong and i never felt that as a child and astrology really opened that up for me it gave me a format that helped me feel like i could um belong and feel a sense of meaning and astrology basically sealed it for me i was like gosh how can i do this where i'm able to understand humans even more and feel like i belong on this planet even more the next step was psychology that's so cool okay so astrology and then psychology and that's where you are and through birth charts you are now into more into people's heart and brain if that's it's right nice okay what is the ratio of the kind of people that you have seen so far and what would you say that could cover the number of people in tech i would say uh it ranges based on the year um sometimes it's 15 to 20% sometimes it's as much as 50% of the people i'm seeing and sometimes i see couples or individuals and where one couple in a couple maybe both are in tech or one is right uh but people in tech in a multiple in multiple ways so it's not just people in tech who do say software development or programming or something so overall so far you might have worked with if you had to count how many people in tech <laughs> <laughs> I've seen I've been seeing okay just to give you an idea of how many clients I've seen. I started seeing clients. Well, officially started seeing clients. So, before the official point when I started off in um internships, before that I still had some clients I saw. I've been seeing people at a in a therapeutic capacity since I was 19. However, in a master's and PhD program, just counting those clients from then. I would say since my I've never actually given a number to this, but if I had to guess, I've seen probably well over 2500 clients at this point. Wow. So, and that's not even counting, that's not counting like uh before I was officially doing therapeutic type stuff with people. Wow. So, yeah. just to give you an idea. So, <laughs> when you ask me like how many have been in tech, yeah. well, give you to give you an idea. all my official my official client work in my studies just looking at that was done in the bay area the san francisco bay area and i would say more than 50% of my clientele were in tech somehow so i've i've met with a lot of people over the years in tech <laughs> Okay. So like Yeah, I don't have a specific number, but just to give you an idea. Okay. So from like you see if you've seen like 2500, probably assume like 50 or 60% of that is people in tech, which is a lot of people yet. So okay. Okay, good math. <laughs> that was quick math. <laughs> nice. Okay. So with that, um I think we can get into some serious stuff about the patterns the fact that you've seen so many people in this capa- capacity means that you know the ins and outs of the kind of recurring patterns that appear with a certain type of persona maybe not all of them are the same some are different of course because each human is different but maybe we could start with the gist of patterns that you were you've noticed in your practice so far so what i found is that a lot of folks in tech the ones who've come for help with me as well as just folks I've gotten to know on a personal level 
belong to companies where there's some pretty dysfunctional power structures. There's a workplace environment that is at least subtly abusive or exploitative. It, it's, a, it's a systemic issue. And I think there's a lot of reasons why these workplaces end up being like this. And it's, I don't think it's even, it's not even necessarily the tech industry that's there's like a much bigger problem here i don't want to get into that but i want to give that context because what the things i notice in people who come to me it's also within that environment that they're working in which can be something that is deeply stressful for most people to deal with so there's i think one thing a lot of people in tech have really struggled with that meet with me is that they've gotten so far removed from understanding what's there's this strong expectation in the field of tech that people disregard themselves their signals in their body their own authentic motivations for the sake of going after what is presented as optimal or would make them successful. so you know working on social communication skills that's a lot of things but yeah that sounds like a list of everything i feel i have felt or i know people around me so i would love to hear your thoughts on like how you help them through each of these so that the listener also can understand if they're seeing the same patterns in themselves maybe something that they can do as takeaways i think the biggest feelings that i hear are like fear and a sense of obligation towards something that they've been brought up with but constantly fighting with fear, which shows up in different mannerisms. Yeah. Um, let's go with what has been really trendy lately, because I think that that's a good endpoint. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of content creators talking about nervous system regulation, talking about self-regulation, talking about um, dealing with acute stress responses or um, fight, flight, or freeze responses, stuff like that. So oftentimes we have to spend some time understanding what that means to them. So for instance, I find a lot of folks who say they've got fear, they need to understand that the fear they're experiencing is actually panic or terror. Why is this important? So panic and terror are connected to survival responses. If we can have a fear of something happening, right? Like we all have fears that come up every day because we live in a world that is unpredictable and we can't control everything. So there's gonna be some fear, there's gonna be some stress and anxiety. Usually though, when people get to the point of seeking help for their fear, it's because they realize they've got terror or panic and it's stopping them from being able to function the ways that they would like to. So when your terror or panic is stopping you from functioning, what that actually means on a nervous system level is you have a set of survival responses that are kicking in that are leading you to go on like this uh, automated hyperdrive response that isn't actually helping. So a lot of folks with fear, maybe their solution if they're perfectionistic is to become even more perfectionistic. Like I'm, I'm fearful, so I'm gonna become even harder on myself. I'm gonna try to do it even more perfect. I'm gonna try to have even more control. That's not just, that's panic. That's panic-based behavior, where despite seeing that it's harming you and it's possibly harming other people, you still do it because you have to. You feel this sense of, I have to do this in order to be okay. So what I have written down here on my notes is basically the ways I help people deal with uh, panic as it arises, <laughs> the different angles, okay? So, um, when I said in the last question that people come to me and they realize that they've entered their work based on fear and obligation, what I would then do is have them do some self-exploration work with me around what they authentically feel motivated to do. So outside of the realm of I'm going to die or my family's going to die if, if I can't have income, which is, I know sounds kind of dramatic, but I mean, that's the root of it, right? I would have you stop and go, okay, if we weren't looking at this from the realm of a survival response where you're, you know, you're in this automated urgent space, what do you authentically feel motivated to do? Again, people start there. And sometimes people have spent their whole lives um, just learning how to be productive or helpful, that they haven't actually explored what they like, what they feel motivated to do authentically. So this can be a whole process, right? Like it's, it can be this huge self-discovery for a lot of folks to stop and go, hold on. Yeah. What do I actually feel motivated to do? 
right? Because what we feel authentically motivated to do can sometimes, or not sometimes, most of the time, gives us insight into what we might want to do for work. Or if it doesn't give us insight into what we'd want to do for work, it can give us insight into uh, how we'd want to spend our time outside of work that's going to help us feel more fulfilled and is going to help us feel like we can somehow find a way to make the work we're doing feel meaningful, feel like it's supporting us in what we do outside of work. A lot of time, the root of this can be a lot of trauma that people go through in their lives. Um, so I like whenever anybody comes in and they're showing me that they're pretty disconnected from themselves uh, or dissociated from their body, we start to do an exploration of like, okay, well, what has your life been like? What are the things you've gone through? Oftentimes people are in great denial about how deeply impacted they are by the things that have happened to them in life. Because for them, they had to keep surviving. They had to just keep pushing through. So I provide a space where people can talk about it, get acknowledgement for actually how deeply they've been impacted by the things that have happened in their lives. And then from there, help them find a way to become more deeply connected to their body, to their emotions, um, to recognize not only signals for hunger or, you know, enjoy wanting enjoyment in certain ways or desire, but also helping them get into connection with how emotions are impacting them. So there's some people that feel deeply sad, but they feel just really irritated or they think they're really irritated or angry, but actually they're feeling, yeah, actually they're feeling really deeply sad and they have a lot of grief about things that have happened. Like they've got a deep sense of loss they need to process. Another one, um, I try to help people learn to be more courageous and take more risks in life. Yeah. How do you do so, that? <laughs> well, you have to do it in an incremental way. Yeah. So sometimes people are like, oh yeah, I want to go learn to, I've, I've had some, some guys I've met who really wanted help with finding a girlfriend, for instance. Okay. And, and they're like, I want to go learn to, to go up to women in real life and talk to them. And I was like, well, that's a great goal. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a hard time making eye contact with people, uh, no matter what, and you feel pretty shy, why don't we break this into smaller pieces, right? So that might mean uh, when you're out in public, taking a few moments to make eye contact with a couple random strangers, right? Because we all look at people who we think are really courageous and we think, oh, wow, they were just born that way. And I mean, sure, I think there are some people with a temperament where they're just born that way. But primarily, people who are courageous are there because they've worked at it, right? It's kind of like working a muscle. When you go to the gym, you don't start lifting 30 kilograms, right? Like, inst or I don't know, 60 something pounds, right? Like you don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, Instead, you start off with a lower amount of weight and that's okay. Like courage is still worth, you're still worthy of celebrating courage you're developing or, you know, you, it's still a worthy use of your time if you break it into smaller amounts that don't feel overwhelming or only slightly overwhelming. Finding that spot where you can still be pretty activated, like pretty freaked out, but you still can do it. Like there's just that moment where you're like, you know what? I got this. I can do it. Uh, so I help people find where that window is for them. And then we practice doing things that feel a little scary. And then you build off of it. And whenever you can successfully do something that feels a little scary, guess what? That helps you feel confident and it helps you feel motivated to do something more that feels scary. Until eventually you work up to a place where you've got the level of courage needed in order to do the thing you really want to be doing. Very interesting. It, especially the one that you said about dating and talking about that sounds like a hardcore tech problem for sure. This is the number yes. of men there. So, yeah. 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 You know, I think that's where the world of online dating is a little, it's, it's both a positive and a negative here, right? Because online dating presents an environment where, um, you can have access to people and it's maybe not as scary initially, right? But it's, it's not challenging a lot of folks to develop the social skills necessary for how you actually end up in a sustainable committed partnership or even the, um, the skills needed to meet up with somebody in person. So it's, it's great. It can help you meet a lot of people and realize, oh yeah, people, they're just people, right? We're all just people. Um, but it's, it's tricky though, too, because there are ways that um, some people in tech get so dependent on using online dating. I think all of us do that um, we're not 
maybe we're not challenging ourselves to, to keep pushing on the, the envelope on being courageous, right? Um, taking risks to put yourself out there, be more vulnerable. Uh, let's see. Um, another one with burnout with work that people come to me uh, around. I would say I help people look at where they need to set better boundaries. So sometimes folks who have a lot of like their middle management, it seems to be the most challenging role for a lot of folks because um, you have several people higher up that you're reporting to that are, you know, looking at certain metrics that are being kind of, in my opinion, at times pretty unreasonable about what you're expected to do. Uh, and then below you, you have a ton of people you're trying to, to work with that um, it's just hard to corral everybody and work with everybody's personalities and uh, get all these different goals done where some of the goals are not even a reasonable, um, <laughs> there aren't reasonable expectations set by management, right? So this is where it's important to learn where you can set boundaries. So for a lot of folks that are per perfectionistic and kind of people pleasing, you maybe say yes to a lot of things when you don't wanna do them. And you don't realize that in a work environment, you could actually set a boundary, right? You could say, hey, listen, I'm recognizing I have this, this, and this on my plate. I don't think I can actually complete what you're asking of me. And that, that can feel scary for a lot of people to tell somebody above them because they, they fear they're gonna lose their job or people are gonna feel critical of them. And there's kind of a workplace uh, culture created about like pretending like everything's fine and you've got it and you can do it. Um, but but actually, actually more tech workplaces, their health when people are able to have conversations like that, when they're able to say, you know what, um, I really want to be able to get this done for you. And I recognize with all of this on my plate, I'm not going to be able to. How about we check in this time, right? Like it's, if you do this, you may find that in the workplace you're in, people might have negative views of you. However, you will also gain some big points for having the courage to tell people that. Yeah. And additionally, their management, whoever's above you, actually anybody working with you is going to trust you a lot more and respect you a lot more if you're able to be honest with them, really authentic. Uh, because there's there are a lot of, in particular, a lot of people in management who get extremely frustrated by folks who just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got this, I got this. And then they disappear and they can't get a hold of them. <laughs> because when you're trying to set boundaries by just disappearing, eventually that comes to bite you, comes to get you in the end. You kind of create your own issue doing that. Uh, and I see that there's a there's a cultural component here because, um, you know, people from different cultures, there's different ways you learn to set boundaries or you say no or um, way you work with authority having um, commands of you, right? But I think this is where there needs to be a really honest conversation that each party needs to start having in order to create a culture in the workplace where we can actually get things done faster because people are being honest about what they can do. <laughs> And then when you're setting boundaries, you know what that leads to? That leads to you having more mental capacity to go do self-care, go do things outside of work. Maybe you're, these boundaries will actually help you have more time away from work, which is a really good thing for you and ultimately will be really good for your productivity too. But the ones that are starting to go in the direction of being healthier, they recognize that their employees really need a work-life balance and that we need to readdress what we were even thinking was a work-life balance. It's in the process of changing in that direction, but this is where you need, anybody in tech needs to take responsibility for the fact that if you are not setting boundaries, if you are not being clear with people about what you're capable of doing, or if you don't understand something, not asking a question, that's when you're adding to your load, you're making yourself a lot more stressed out, and you're making life really quite miserable for yourself. Oh, social connections. I also like to help people learn the importance of building stronger community. So getting outside, going to things, going to events, you know, finding groups of people you can connect with in person where you're not talking about work and you're doing fun things, joyful things, things that remind you of why you're on this planet and making money in the first place. I think that that's, that's basically it. I could get more into specifics, but I think it would take um, a long time to go into the full detail of all of these different but I just wanted to give you yeah yeah I think this is great overall I think the last thing that we could probably jump in is we've spoken about authenticity is like how can one bring authenticity to their everyday job for like whoever wants to continue being in tech another way to look at authenticity is having a deeper connection with yourself and not only feeling it 
internally, but prioritizing expressing it. So what that means, authenticity can be acknowledging when you're not feeling very good, like acknowledging that to yourself, spending some time getting to explore what's going on inside that has you not feel so good and why, what is it based on? And then from there, making it a point to develop relationships where you feel safe sharing this stuff with people. And the reason why that's important is because when you have relationships where you feel safe and you can talk about this stuff, it, it's a way to build the courage to share more authentically in a larger context, right? In a broader context. So for instance, even for myself, I would not have shared about my personal history the way that I did in this interview here 10 years ago. I just wouldn't because I didn't yet feel safe enough. I hadn't worked up the courage to share at that level. However, I've cultivated relationships in my life where I can share, I can be honest with myself first about how I'm feeling and what has happened to me. And then I've cultivated relationships where I can share honestly too. I can really show what's in my heart. And I've built up to the point where I can tolerate knowing that there's going to be people who watch this and go, you know, have all sorts of responses that are negative and know that it doesn't necessarily mean anything about my inherent worth or worthiness of being on this planet or my lovability, right? So developing more authenticity has to do with just being really honest with yourself. It also has to end others. It also has to do with giving yourself permission to be human. So there's automatically right off the bat discouragement people get around being themselves, right? But that's where you need to take it on yourself to give yourself permission to be human. So that means like, if you're hungry, eat. If you're thirsty, drink water. Like these are some basic things. If you want to go have some fun, go have fun. If you're feeling upset about something, that's probably a human thing to feel upset about that. You know, to start giving yourself permission to have a reaction to what's happening to you in life is one of the most subversive things you could actually do in this day and age, because there's so much out there that tells us, no, you should be this way. You should feel this way. This is the right way. This is the wrong way. When in actuality, like all of us feel shame, all of us feel fear, all of us feel disempowered at times, all of us feel very confused or lost at times, but you have to give yourself permission to have these experiences. Like you first have to give yourself permission to have the exact experience you're having and doing all the things you're doing to then be able to start to shift anything. And, and then I would also say working with perfectionism and shame, very important. So I know that Brene Brown has become like really popular <laughs> in past years, right? And, you know, if you have a chance, listen to her podcasts or list or, you know, listen to her audiobooks or read her books, right? Not because they'll heal you of your shame, but they'll help you realize that everybody's got shame. We all have perfectionism to some degree. Um, different cultures, more perfectionism than others. Granted, I think American culture has a pretty high level of perfectionism too. But reading these books helps you start to understand uh, the subtle ways that shame shows up in our lives and the way it is associated with survival responses that block us from doing something that actually feels better for us, or um, I'm doing this because like it's more aligned with authenticity. Because if we're focused on survival and fending off fear and stress, that's what we're, that's what our life is oriented around. So working with shame, that's a huge one, working with trauma responses and shame. Uh, but even if you just want to get into the shame piece, that can make a huge difference. Uh, because if you go up and ask for a raise and you know that you're dealing with another human and you don't have to like put this pressure on yourself to be perfect as you're asking or that you have to be perfect to deserve a raise, you're going to ask for that raise. And you'll probably ask for it in a way that is much better than if you are coming from this super stressed, hyper perfectionist place. I think that was very, very impactful, honestly. I, I think that oh, motivated great. me on this holiday <laughs> morning, almost holiday morning. Yeah, I feel really motivated and I feel like I would like to end with that because it was the perfect impact. How do you feel? Great. Do you feel this a good end as well? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's just one piece I want to express overall okay. here. Um, the whole reason I wanted to have this talk with you is because I really, I see how it, how important it is that all of us, no matter what type of work we do, feel more connected to 
the human race in regard to the fact that we all work with the same stuff. Like just because you're in tech does not mean that your issues are like any worse or better than somebody that works with a completely different field. Like that's what's so amazing. It's like I've worked with a lot of folks in tech and I would say that they're very similar to everybody who's not working in tech too. <laughs> Uh, we all humans respond to environments that feel unsafe. All humans, when they feel unsafe, f do and experience different things. So, and all humans can benefit from these things that I've expressed here today, right? So, you know, there's some folks feel so stuck in what they're in with their work and lifestyle, right? That they can't see that this is just basically some of the same issues that everybody goes through. And the bigger picture here is how do I deal with stress? How do I deal with nervous system responses? How do I deal with fear? Uh, how do I deal with perfectionism? And that my perception that I'm stuck or my negativity or my burnout is just part of how the nervous system influences perception. So yes, tech presents its own unique set of experiences around us being stuck, but I can tell you there's lots of people having experiences of feeling stuck and it's it's because it's it's not the actual environment that is making us stuck i mean there's there are circumstances that certainly make it much harder to leave but the stuck feeling itself isn't just the environment that, that this is workable you can work with this mm. and that sort of impacts every human in a way around us no matter what they do or how yeah. they are it's just the same Simply putting it, it, it feels like very in the universe, connected together is the kind of vision that I get when we talk about these yeah. things. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for your You're time welcome. and your wonderful thoughts. You're very welcome. This was amazing. Yeah, there was a ton of things that we discussed, which I'm sure people are going to love to listen and understand and authentically reflect to themselves and I will add links to your website and things as well so people can reach out to you okay. but yeah thank you so awesome. much you're very welcome